I welcome everyone to this academic uh, session arranged by uh, the ASG Academic Cell. We have had previous uh, talks on pediatric retinal detachments, inverted island flaps, vitreoretinal interface disorders, optic disc, uh, pit maculopathy, scleral buckling, heart cataract, pneumatic retinopexy, uh, imaging and integrating retinal detachment, diabetic vitrectomy, maximizing outcomes of choric IOL, retinal detachment, and now today is the session on management of proliferative vitreoretinopathy. We are privileged to have Dr. Ulrich Spandau with us, who is currently at the University of Stockholm, Sweden. He studied medicine at the University of Augsburg in Germany. He did residencies in the Department of Ophthalmology at University of Middleburg <laughs> and University of Mannheim, Middleburg. Surgical training, he received surgical training in eye clinic, Koblenz. He is a, an ex consultant at uh, Department of Ophthalmology, University of Mannheim, Middleburg, and ex vice director of the department. He also did PhD. He uh, was a consultant and head of the surgery at the Department of Ophthalmology in University Hospital of Uppsala, Sweden. He has published more than 52 uh, articles in index peer review journals. He has published multiple books on various uh, aspects of vitreoretinal surgery. And he has published a uh, book on retinal detachment su surgery and proliferative vitreoretinopathy, which is published by Springer. We have with us Dr. Wilson Wong, who is a, a senior vitreoretinal surgeon at OSS Eye Specialist Malaysia. He, did it, he is a fellow of Royal College of Ophthalmologists. He did his vitreoretinal fellowship at Flinders Medical Center and Royal Adelaide Hospital in Australia. Uh, we are privileged to have a uh, senior uh, vitreoretinal surgeon, Dr. Dipendra Vikram Singh, who, uh, who did his MD ophthalmology from Ames New Delhi and also senior residency from Ames New Delhi under the same mentor as of me, uh, Dr. Professor Jograj Sarma. He is currently the director and head of the vitreoretinal services at IQ Super Specialty Eye Hospitals, India. He is also secretary to the ethics committee at I Super Specialty Eye Hospital. Uh, he has published multiple articles and he is also the editor in chief of Haryana Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, we in the panelist, we also have Dr. Ekta Risi, who is currently in the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, she did uh, MS Ophthalmology from SS Medical College, Madhya Pradesh. She did her uh, vitreoretinal fellowship from Shankar Netralaya Chennai, and she is a senior vitreoretinal surgeon at Shankar Netralaya Chennai. She has, to her credit, more than five, 125 PubMed index peer due to public colleagues. Uh, I'll now request Dr. Uh, Ulrich to please uh, face us with us uh, with his presentation. Okay, um, I don't see a picture actually now. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, then I will start. Um, this is my eye clinic in, in Stockholm at the corner here. It has 10 floors, it's huge. Um, I'll start with the definition of PVR detachment. Um, the name proliferative retinopathy was provided in 1989 by the Silicon Oil Study Group. The name is derived from proliferation of the retinal uh, pigment Dr. Dr. Ulrich, your, yes? uh, your slide is not visible. Uh -huh. Let's see what happened now. I do, um, I'm, I do share screen again. Yes, please. Perfect, yes. Um, the name is derived from proliferation of the RPE and glial cells and vitreoretinopathy to include the tissues 
which are affected, namely the vitreous and the retina. We come to the management. The current management is the surgical relief of vitreal, preretinal, and subretinal tractions. The final aim is the reestablishment of retinal attachment and visual function. The principle of management are the closure of all retinal breaks. This is achieved with the identification and closure of all breaks. The next principle is the relief of traction. This is achieved by membrane dissection and retinotomy. The third principle is the long-term retinal stabilization. This is achieved by laser photocoagulation, sterile buckle, and intraocular tamponade. I come now to the surgery step by step. We start with encircling band, then phaco emulsification and IOL, vitreous staining with triamcinolone, corbitrectomy, staining of membranes with tripan blue, then removal of central epiretinal membranes, then insulation of PFCL or PFC, then removal of peripheral epiretinal membranes, then vitreous base shaving, then maybe removal of supplemental membranes, then laser photocoagulation, then maybe endoiridectomy and tamponade. So we go step for step now. In the circling band, relieves traction at the vitreous base. It facilitates also the closure of peripheral retinal breaks. And finally, an encircling band supports the vitreous base during anterior dissection. We place encircling band in eyes with PVR detachment. A surgical tip, um, we use a 3.5 millimeter band, for example, um, um, and place the band on the equator. Or you can use um, the measurement, the half, half axial length behind the limbus. So if you have a 24 millimeter eye, place encircling band 12 millimeter behind the limbus. Here's a video of the encircling band. We use a 3.5 millimeter band. And then we fasten it with this sleeve in the infratemporal position. For vitrectomy of PVR detachment, we recommend, regardless of the age, a phaco emulsification with IL implantation in the bag. The lens removal allows visualization of the vitreous base and assessment of anterior PVR. And it allows, more importantly, the surgical excess of the vitreous base. We avoid a pass planar lensectomy because the lens capsule is absent, which serves otherwise as a scaffold between the posterior and interior chamber. It's another video of a phaco emulsification. I will keep it short because I think you know how to do this surgery. The next step is the um, corbitrectomy. This is a main step in um, this part of surgery because it results in relief of transvitreal traction. We use a standard three-port uh, PPV with 25 gauge trocard cannulas. We use 25 gauge, not 25, three gauge because smaller trocars require smaller instruments. And this results in less traumatic surgery and less leakage from the trochars. One surgical tip, 
stain the vitreous with tramcinolone. Here you see the video um, of a covitrectomy. And this is the important part because it results in the relief of transvitreal traction. Next step is a membrane staining. We use a syringe with 25 gauge cannula and membrane dual from DORC. A surgical tip, how to stain peripheral membranes, stain them under air. So you drop the, the dye in an air-filled eye. You see it on this picture here. And with this way, you achieve a high concentration of the dye in the periphery. So now I'm doing a fluid air exchange. You see the perif peripheral membranes, and I drop the dye directly onto the peripheral membranes. And of course, then you can continue removing these stained membranes. And this is an example of staining with membrane dual dog. The left eye is nothing and the right eye is stained. The next step is membrane removal. The removal of preternal membranes results in relief of preternal traction. All epiretinal membranes must be removed. Even in case of retinotomy, remove all membranes up to the retinotomy edges. If you leave epiretinal membranes, then they will continue to proliferate and cause attractive detachment. Begin with removal at the membranes located at the posterior pole and continue with membrane dissection in the peripheral retina. So begin at the posterior pole and they continue in the periphery. Here's one example of removal of central membranes. You see that I'm working by manual. So I'm uh, using uh, a, a chandelier light. I use this as a standard for difficult detachments. The left eye, you see a forceps. In the right eye, now there's a vitreous cutter. In the right instrument is a so-called knop spatula, which is from the company, um, it's, it's a UK company, I think iTech from UK. Um, it's, it's a very nice instrument to uh, delaminate the membranes. This actual patient who had an acute retinal necrosis and with an attachment. That's why I had these severe membranes here. So then the next step is the fractionized PFCL installation. After central peeling, Insert PFCL only to the mid periphery and remove then the peripheral membranes. The PFCL acts as counter pressure. Here you see the injection of PFCL.
Then the next step is the removal of peripheral membranes. Bimineral peeling is the key is the key to success. Insert a chandelier light. A surgical tip: ruptures occur under peripheral peeling. Don't be bothered. You can cauterize them and then treat them. So again, if you have ruptures occurring during the peeling, just cauterize the ruptures and then place a laser there. Here's one example of peripheral removal of cyclic membranes. It's again, you see um, done in a bimanual fashion. In the right hand, you have the Knopp spatula from iTechnologies UK. And now you have the straight scissors, uh, 25 gauge, I think from the same company. The left hand, there's end gripping forceps. And the cyclic membranes are removed. Now the virtuous cutter. Now you can continue on the on the right eye, please. And on the right video, you see that I'm I grasped a membrane with this um, knob spatula. Here's the membrane which is removed with the vitreous cutter. Then there is more peeling to be done. You see this this long membrane which I'm trying to delaminate with this uh, knob spatula. Okay, then the next step is the complete insulation of perfluorocarbone. The next step is the shaving of the vitreous base. Note that the perfluorocarbone is injected up the vitreous base, which facilitates vitrectomy. So I was wrong, this is the video. So um, the perfluorocarbone acts as a counter pressure and stabilizes the mobile retina so that you can remove the um, vitreous base. And again, um, I'm working here with chandelier light. The left hand is the sterile depressor, which is uh, indenting the sclera. So the next step is laser treatment. Um, these are like common settings we use. And again, the laser is done under perfluorocarbone. And now comes a very interesting um, video. I'm doing now fluid air exchange. Please watch this video very carefully. It, it, it contains a complication. Fluid air exchange. Did you see this? So when you perform 
a fluid air exchange, then the air may escape through a rupture into the subregional space. What happened? The, the retina is not mobile in this area and too stiff. So what to do? A tamponade does not work. If you use a tamponade in this specific moment, then the gas will migrate as the air under the retina. If you use silicon oil, which has less surface tension pressure, then, will, then this will also go subretinal. So the solution actually is to do more peeling to mobilize the retina and or to place a segmental buckle. So in this case, a circling band was, was already placed onto the sclera. So I would add here a segmental silicon tire under this rupture to buckle this, um, this rupture. The next step is silicon oil injection. Prepare the anterior chamber. I'm sorry. Do an endohydridectomy if necessary. A surgical tip. Inject little viscoelastics in the interior chamber if necessary. In silicon oil-filled eyes, there will be no IOP increase. So here's an endoridectomy. It is located at six o'clock in case of 1,000, 1,300 and 5,000 oil. And at 12 o'clock in case of Denzerone Extra. So depending on the silicon oil, you have to choose an edectomy at 12 or 6 o'clock. Here's one video of an endoridectomy at 6 o'clock. I am pulling the iris and now some diathermy on the edge of the um, edectomy. Next step is the silicon oil exchange. We have two possibilities for silicon oil exchange, direct or indirect. In this case, this is a direct exchange. And you can see that the infusion line is connected to the silicon oil syringe. Now, this is one more tip from my side. The Alcon infusion detaches under silicon oil. So, Use the dog infusion line. This will not detach. So do not use our confusion line. If you do a direct exchange, because this will detach, use please the dog infusion line. Um, in this direct exchange, we have three fluid phases, silicon oil, BSS and PFC, you remove first the BSS phase. If you have retinectomy or a giant tear, then do a thorough fluid removal on this height before you continue with the PFC phase. So first BSS in a thorough removal and the retinectomy height and then the PFC. So in indirect air silicon oil exchange, I'm sorry for the noise now, the silicon oil is injected into an air-filled eye. I actually personally prefer this approach. I apologize for the noise of the video. So coming to the silicon oil tamponade time, the duration of silicon oil tamponade depends on age of patient and pathology. In a normal case, for 1,000 oil, we have one to three months. In 5,000 centistoke oil, we have three months to indefinite. In denzero and 6.8 or extra, 1.5 to three months. 
in young patients, we, we avoid indefinite tamponade. In trauma cases with a low IOP, we prefer a long life silicon oil tamponade. I'm coming now to some special challenges. The first challenge is subretinal membranes. Subretinal perforations are present in nearly half the cases of PVR, but rarely prevent retinal reattachment. Must all proliferations be removed? No, only the significant ones. A significant subretinal membrane is one that will preclude flattening of the retina unless it is removed. The significance becomes obvious when PFCL is instilled. Remove a subretinal membrane only if the posterior retina is not flattened under PFCL. So again, only a very few subretinal membranes must be removed. Now comes a video about subretinal membranes removal. Now I'm using two forceps to extract the subretinal membrane. And the important point actually is just now to prevent that this tear gets too large. So to, to make an atraumatic removal membrane, not to create a huge tear when doing this removal. See, this is a very thick um, membrane. So we're almost done. This is second challenge is the retinectomy. Um, a retinotomy should only be performed in the second or later surgery. You should avoid retinectomy in the first surgery. Typically, it goes like this. PVR detachment and first surgery with silicon oil tamponade. Then inferior redetachment and second surgery with retinotomy and again silicon oil tamponade. And three months later, silicon oil removal. Remark, even if you perform a retinotomy, you need to remove all membranes up to the retinotomy edges. If you do not peel the membranes, then the retina will contract and the silicon oil and the retinotomy edges will roll in. So the main surgical steps for retinotomy are the aura parallel diathermy, the retinotomy, 
and the removal of anterior retina, which is a retinectomy. Um, my surgical tip is that a 180 degrees retinotomy is usually sufficient. This is a post-operative photograph of 180 degrees retinotomy and laser coagulation of the edges. The third challenge is a complication, which is quite inter interesting. Um, this is a 360 degree laser in an eye with encircling band. So um, if you place a laser on the sclera impression, there will be no complication. But if you do the same procedure in an eye without encircling band, then observe the following. There is a good tamponade in the upper part with silicon oil, which may be 90%, but there's always no tamponade on the lower pole. So the laser effects in the lower pole have a problem. I'll show you a video. So please note here this long chain of retinal tears created by laser necrosis. This is the inferior pole. Otherwise, there's no PVR. Now we come to the last challenge, which is a redetachment. Typical PVR detachments require approximately three surgeries. So I tell my patients, these difficult eyes, that they need approximately three surgeries. The recurrent PVR detachment occurs after two to four weeks. And surgery includes removal of silicon oil, then the removal of membranes, if necessary, a retinotomy and injection of silicon oil. In the third surgery, the silicon oil is removed. The end, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, Dr. Ulli, thanks. Thanks for this uh, elaborate presentation. Uh, I'll now request uh, Dr. Dipender sir for his comments or in or practical tips to manage cases with PVR and specifically cases with three detachments, inferior three detachments. Uh, excellent videos and uh, uh, very nicely elaborated. It was a real uh, treat for uh, I'm sure fellows uh, if they are attending the session, they must have learned a lot and. Uh, all these steps, uh, I think, very nicely elaborated by Dr. Ulrich. I congratulate him. And uh, I think I'll try to add, uh, just for the sake of avoiding repetition, uh, the points which I feel can be added. One is, uh, I think, in the cases which are at high risk of, for PVR, uh, preoperative factors like, you know, you all know that choroidal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, one should always plan a primary ILM peeling for macula. Uh, not for all regular uncomplicated detachments, but high risk cases. Uh, big advantage is that if this case redetaches uh, and, and you know if you have limited PVR, you can always do a resurgery under silicon oil itself. Uh, if you have a couple of star folds uh, redetaching the inferior retina, uh, you can easily get rid of them under silicon oil. And if your ILM has already been peeled off macula. So you don't have much work to do in this uh, second surgery for PVR. And 
also i would like to uh, i think uh, uh, ask fellows that sometimes you see small star folds in uh, early redetachment after uh, uh, surgery uh, under silicon oil so try to find out another cause also for redetachment sometimes there is a open break which actually uh, you know has created an early redetachment and star folds itself may not be the cause for redetachment so if you fix up that under oil and these those early star folds can actually very well disappear so that was the point uh, i wanted to add and when you start doing these uh, pvr surgeries i think when you see those star folds and erm many times uh, uh, i think beginners would uh, try to find out that which should be the place where i initiate i think uh, one good tip is that you try to look uh, look at the blood vessels you know and the area where blood vessels almost disappear they are least visible it's really the thickest part of the membrane and uh, so so you can again go by your conventional pinch and grasp technique and uh, you know remove uh, those membranes and if there are immature membranes with early star fold and you are trying to operate sometimes you can feel ilm around the star fold and take off the star fold along with the ilm uh, so this is another thing i wanted to highlight and uh, i think if you are trying to uh, uh, add a encircling band if you are planning to uh, reoperate a pvr case so earlier we used to uh, say that uh, don't tighten the band uh, you know uh, till you have done your endo laser but now with our, with wide angle viewing systems and we are all doing very good indentation you 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 you, you should actually do the reverse you should tighten the encircling band and see how much traction you can relieve by the band and then go for a fluid air exchange because you can still do the posterior edge uh, laser at the posterior edge of uh, edge of the band by indentation uh and and in in that process you will end up doing less amount of retinectomy uh, you know if you have tightened the band before uh, fluid air exchange so this is again uh, something some modification which uh, we have started doing uh, for quite a few years uh, otherwise i think I, i agree with all the points uh, most of us are not using any pharma uh, pharmacological intervention to prevent uh, redevelopment of pvr but we are definitely looking forward to uh, you know some drugs uh, the results of some studies which can help us uh, tackle this uh, uh, difficult situation so uh, these are the points i would like to add for this thank you sir uh, i'll uh, request dr ekta ma'am's uh, inputs on managing pvrs pvr cases and also how how do we prevent like If I see a, if I am operating a case with coronary artery enlargement, there is hypotony. Uh, how is there any way, clinically acceptable way to prevent the PVR and prevent artery enlargement? Uh, thank you, Doctor Kaushik. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting talk, and thank you, Dr. Ulrich, for this well-elaborated talk. We really enjoyed the videos; they were real good quality and some nice, interesting tips. So, uh, but we are talking about PBR. Uh, one is like even the reason is like ethnicity, so more pigmented. Uh, races tend to have more PVR. How PVR generates? That's what we have to understand first. So, PVR is basically coming from the retinal pigment epithelial cells. But there are things where there are larger retinal breaks, or there are more number of retinal breaks, extended retinal detachments, and even the retinal detachments which are becoming chronic. so they tend to have more pvr changes so those who have more inflammation again tend to have more pvr changes pediatric age group we tend to see more pvr so whenever we have an inflamed eye it's always a good idea to give some preoperative 
steroid treatment, like in choroidal detachment, and that really helps to reduce the inflammation. Why PVR is happening is because, uh, you know, when the retina detaches, there is a separation between the RPE and it's becoming hypoxic. So there is a breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. And this is what is causing the retinal pigment epithelial cells to proliferate, come through the breaks inside the vitreous cavity and then proliferate as a pre-retinal membrane. Or if they remain inside under the subretinal space, then they proliferate as subretinal fibrosis. So inflammation reduction is one step. So choroidal detachment, I tend to wait for a while, reduce some inflammation with steroids and then try to go in. And I prefer putting silicon oil in these eyes compared to gas, as these eyes are more prone to have redetachment. Secondly, sometimes in inflamed eyes like ARN or HIV patients also, I tend to go for a heavier silicon oil because I tend to keep them for longer. So that is one thing. Second is a good PVD induction and adequate traction removal, which was very well stressed by Dr. Elrich in one of the videos that unrelieved traction can lead to subretinal air or silicon oil injections. So try to remove them well. And then if there, if there is an intra-retinal fibrosis, try to do retinectomy and try to relieve the traction. So it's a very good talk and it's something which we all see in our day-to-day -day basis. And this is like something which has already, there are some trials which have been done on pharmacotherapy, but not much has been achieved by use of preoperative steroids, methotrexate, 5-fluorouracil, even vitamin A has been used as a retinoic acid. Although it has shown some improvement in these eyes, but most of the pharmacotherapy has not shown much change and we don't have very big trials to support that. Thank you, ma'am. I have a Thank question so for much. Dr. Thank you, ma'am. I have a question for Dr. Ulrich. There is a uh, question in chat box. Any comments on PFCL in situ for redetachment cases? Yes, I have. Uh, I just responding to this question. I have no experience with PFC inside. I must admit, I'd never do that. Uh, Dr. Dipendra, sir. I think uh, yes. I would also say that not much of experience, except in a couple of trauma cases where I removed a large foreign body and detachment. Uh, it was left unintentionally uh, because uh, you know because of media issues. So, uh, uh, yeah, I did well, but you have to go back in after two weeks. Uh, so, in general, uh, I think it gives you only some time, but you have to address uh, the issues which are keeping retina detached. So, uh, uh, I would say uh, as a last resort, you can think of that option, maybe in some circumstances where you feel, uh, you know, positioning and all would be a challenge. It's primarily, uh, you know, used to address the positioning issues rather than PVR. Uh, because PVR, we have to uh, take care of traction one way or the other. Thank you, sir. Uh, your comments, Dr. Wang, on management of PVR? Yeah, hi, Dr. Koshi. Thank you very much. Dr. Ulrich, really wonderful uh, talk and very good tips. And I think that uh, those extra tips by Dr. Dipendra and Dr. Ekta as well. Now, from a very junior consultant opinion, uh, there's some questions that I have, and I think this would be of interest to the other uh, younger VR citizens and fellows out there. And the question really is, I think you mentioned that the encircling buckle that and the calculation that you've had and you've only put a buckle that's only 3.5 mm, and you said that the, the idea is to relieve and to support the, the vitreous phase, and also to support the peripheral uh, break. Now, I'm just curious with every every other panelist out there, uh, is, that, is, is that the size of band that you will use to support the vitreous phase and try to cover your peripheral breaks, or would you actually choose to use a much wider buckle, like a 276 or a 277, to do that. 
That's question number one. Uh, question number two, I think uh, by manual surgery is really the way to go if you've got plenty of membranes. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, just like the tractional diabetic membranes. Uh, my question to you is, Dr. Ulrich, with regards to the direct PFCL oil exchange, um, what exactly are your parameters with regards to the machines in terms of aspiration and oil injection? Do you, do you change that according to the density of oil? Uh, and finally, uh, the other thing that I wanted to share from my personal experience is, yes, be very careful with the 360 uh, laser without the buckle uh, support because I've had a zipper-like uh, uh, pair along the inferior edges, just like, just like the horror, horror movie that you just showed us earlier. Um, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, coming to the first question, um, so I place encircling band to to relieve the vitreous base of the PVR detachment eye, in general, but these these big ruptures, they will not be completely on onto this band, so there will be some fish mouthing, in the lower on the posterior part of of the of the rupture, and this must be assessed. So if you have this big rupture, as I showed on this on this uh, video, exactly there I will place a segmental uh, tire only for this rupture, so that this is completely covered. Otherwise, you will not be able to solve the case because the 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 uh, supplemental air will be uh, yeah. This is a big problem. So just a segmental buckle. Uh, you know, if you take, you know, uh, you know how, what I mean. You take the tire, you you cut a piece and yeah. place it under the uh, yeah. cyclage. Then the second question was, um, can you say your the second question? For the, uh, no, settings, the, yes. Your settings for the yeah. And the cons constellation, uh, if you use this one, they have actually a, a separate program. If you use active aspiration, the silicon oil can be synchronized. It's a very nice feature on the constellation. Um, if, if I use, I must say that I do it less and less, I do a direct exchange. So not so into this very much, but otherwise I would just go on the, I would go to the BSS phase, remove the BSS phase first, and then continue with the, um, with the, the piflocarbon. Um, what was the third question, Dr. Wong? No, that was not a good question. The third question was just a comment, a sharing of, be very careful. Oh, yes, oh, yes, it was hard, yes, I agree. Yes. Mm. How do you deal the cases with immature PPL? Early detachment cases? Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, so if, 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 if you would have like an early, early retouchment with little bit PPR, especially in the inferior places, I would actually sometimes hesitate to remove it because I've seen in quite a few cases, if you insist removing these, these star folds, I mean, I'm talking about immature star folds now, then you definitely will have a reattachment in this area because it's inferior. So I, had, uh, so I tried a few times to relieve them, place encircling band, leave them, silicon oil, and there was no problem, no reattachment. So I think this is maybe a better approach. Um, it may happen that this immature PVR um, gets stronger. You have focal reattachment and a silicon oil, it wouldn't bother me, then I would go in again and remove this one. I think I think if you go if you go in the first surgery and cause a rupture there, if you if the removal, you have a reattachment there. It's so actually, I would be hesitant. What is your opinion? I would be interesting to hear. Dependa, sir, your opinion? I think I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Ulrich. Uh, only only difference is if you have a little posterior star fold, even if it is immature, I, it's difficult to peel ILM also in those areas. So I would try to extend the macular ILM peel in a tear drop, a tear drop fashion towards that star fold. And if I am able to reach and remove it with the ILM, absolutely fine. But I will not do fishing over an immature star fold as rightly pointed out by Dr. Ulrich. Because if you create a break, you are inviting more trouble. 
and many of them they flatten out once you close the primary break and relieve the traction around that like dr ekta very nicely uh, pointed out that rp cells access to vitreous cavity you know uh, we have to stop it anything which keeps the break open uh, will keep pvr going on and on so that uh, again very important i like to just add for the sake of i think some uh, our audience that when we do a direct silicon oil pfo exchange uh, you know uh, we don't do it through infusion uh, tubing we do it uh, through two ports and we use a chandelier so it becomes a bimanual approach and uh, you can always titrate the intraocular pressure in constellation program uh, your injection pressure and aspiration in a way uh, that your optic nerve head is very well perfused so with your one so 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 then you are not dependent on infusion tubing you you use the same syringe which you used to inject oil in one hand and in the other hand you use a active vacuum and uh, the constellation program allows you to do that so you you don't have to do and the third port you insert the chandelier so you are actually uh, you know doing it under direct visualization as manifcus goes uh, slowly down you can follow it till optic nerve head so only i think important tip is titrate Uh, injection pressure and aspiration in a way that eye doesn't get hard and optic nerve pulsations and you know optic nerve is well perfused dipendra sir uh, uh, i am doing in a little different way this uh, direct pfo exchange i uh, take out the infusion cannula and from the infusion cannula i put the silicon oil injector yeah same and, uh, exactly same thing i told but infu- in, instead of uh, removing the infusion cannula you can put a chandelier there and okay the rest of the two ports you can use for injection and aspiration so you are still three port vitrectomy and you are doing it under direct visualization and you are bimanual okay so, because uh, in in my left hand light pipe is there instead of the, that uh, uh, chandelier okay. in the in the yeah. in the infusion cannula we are using the left hand light pipe right hand will have the passive aspiration for the pfc we are we are not using the active aspiration okay. passive ex- i think you can do uh, multiple uh, ways uh, i think it was just uh, how, uh, i think uh, we are, we have almost chandelier open for almost all or so uh, you don't have to uh, like if you have to open a chandelier you can i think uh, do by your technique mm. and uh, uh, one thing dipender sir i want to ask from you what is the right time to take the pvr detachment surgery means if uh, i am seeing a case after 10 days or 15 days i am seeing detachment is there and i am not able to find out the membranes but some wrinkling of the retina is there so we should go at that same point of time or we should wait for a month that some membrane will mature and we'll see it in a much better way i think it's a good question and which we face uh, i think it's a, uh, in our clinics uh, uh, almost every week not every week at least every month i think it depends on macular status uh, a membrane is definitely going to guide you but it also depends on the status of macula and uh, most of these cases will have macula reattach and by say 7 to 10 days they regain some vision and suppose if they have regained very good vision 6 12 6 9 and then you see like two weeks or maybe three weeks macula redetaching i would go in i'll not wait till six weeks even if uh, you know i have to uh, do and and another thing which we do in these early cases is uh, we do a lot of interface vitrectomy under oil and and sometimes you see the you know it's what looks like a star fold is actually residual uh, vitreous and you can still do some stripping some some shaving under oil itself and give it one more chance before going for a more extensive surgery where you will remove oil put a encircling band and do a retinotomy that can be reserved for a much later stage uh, so so for me i think macular status uh, also guides me besides uh, membrane uh, as m- my opinion to Dr. this is uh-huh. If, this, yeah, if, the eye, if the eye has a retention under gas, then I would maximally w- wait one week 
because it goes very fast. If you have a retouchment under silicon oil, there's more time. Um, if, you, if you have like um, PVR in the periphery, little focal attachment, uh, you can wait one, two weeks. If you have a focal attachment PVR, I would not wait more than one week. Um, so I would actually, I'm, I like, but I wouldn't do the next day like this. But in, in type of gas, I would actually go as fast as possible. But well, this can be a much worse situation one week later. Uh, the second question I, like I want to ask. Um, okay, okay. Continue, madam. Yeah, uh, continue. very good uh, comment by Dr. Ulrich, and I agree with him that most of the time the redetachment under gas stresses faster. But when we are talking about primary detachment, uh, it's better to attach the retina as fast as possible because it's causing more photoreceptor death with hypoxia with a, de with a detachment and you can always plan a second surgery in case these immature membranes you're not able to remove in the first sitting. But I don't tend to wait for attaching a retina so as to let the membranes become more mature and the surgery become more easy. Thank you. Do we have Dr. Khakan? Hussein Ahmed Khakan? Uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Okay. Ulrich about his comments on uh, only scleral buckling in silicon oil filled eyes with detachment, like only in pure buckle. Is there buckling in silicon oil filled eyes? Yes. So, 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 what what is the pathology? Uh, you have a silicon oil filled eye, and every re, uh, you have a detachment in the silicon oil. Yes, inferior detachment and inferior anterior breaks uh, with PVR. Well, yes. Uh, so, uh, like in the first surgery, I did a um, PVR surgery without without buckling, no redetachment, then I would um, place, I think I would actually place first encircling buckle, a circling band um, under silicone oil. Um, then I would remove the silicone oil, remove the membranes, laser reticulation and re-inject silicone oil. That's what I think I would do, yes. Thank you, sir. I think uh, Dr. Kaushik, can I add uh, uh, a comment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I could remember uh, one particular situation where uh, I did a, a primary uh, surgery, where a surgery with oil for a patient with detachment with a superior large uh, flap tear. And once I re reattached the retina on table, I realized there was a tephyloma underlying that uh, large flap tear. So I thought probably I have done enough laser around stephyloma and on the break, it will stay on. But that patient had a re-detachment from that uh, you know, lap tear and at the edge of the stephyloma, it, it went down. So in that uh, patient, in that kind of situation where the PVR is not the cause of re-detachment, there is an open break or something which has to be supported by a buckle, like in this case, a stephyloma, which was quite peripheral. Probably uh, uh, the lady had a in childhood injury or something. It was not typical cephaloma. But that worked very well. Uh, and it got reattached and then it never, uh, you know, redetached even after silicone oil removal. But it works. Uh, there, uh, 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 when we were not doing resurgeries under silicone oil, uh, those days, I think many times uh, for these small uh, uh, breaks, which were like either missed or not properly treated, we used to put a uh, buckle in these eyes, oil filled eyes, and it used to work well. But for PBR, I, of course, I think you have to go inside and take care of traction and membranes and other things. Dependa, sir, uh, if some patient is coming with a PVR, means pre or first surgery PVR, which buckle, which band you are using? 3.5 millimeter or 2 millimeter? 
I think uh, normally we stick to thinner bands only. Uh, I would uh, play, uh, place a broad band only if there is a pathology which needs it. And uh, normally I would put a thicker band in a situation where we have a bad pseudophagia or pupil not dilating and patient has multiple lattices with attached vitreous 360 degree and I know even if I do shaving and all, this is not going to get very well supported. But most of the times, uh, pathology is in one particular meridian. So I would rather go for a higher indent rather than a broader uh, uh, 360 degree and uh, buckle. So 99% nine, nine of time, I would go for a 2.5 millimeter band. Dr. Ulrich, what about you? Uh, we use, yeah, I use actually both bands, 3.5 and 2.5 millimeters. Yeah, a good question. Which is the best? I think I think both work fine. Um, I always think if, if you have separate breaks you want to cover, the circling band is not the best. It's not the best way to do this. If there are small breaks, the circling band is very okay. Like you have a myopic patient, but if you have these big ruptures, you have to have a separate procedure to cover these big ruptures. So they would do a combined um, buckle and encircling band. Uh, be because what, what I am what I am doing, uh, I'm using almost like the pendulum, I'm using 99% of the time, maybe 100% of the time only uh, 2.5 millimeter because my aim is to support the vitreous base and anterior part of the vitreous. Not uh, my my aim is not to cover to, to take the break over the buckle. That's why, but but lots of confusion is there means which type of buckle we have to use, whether we have to serve for both the purpose or for the one purpose. So that's why I have asked this question. Lesser the volume you add to orbit is always better. Uh, you know all the buckle associated complications they go higher as you uh, increase the thickness. So, uh, and another thing I would like to add is huge breaks. And uh, many times there was a concept that uh, giant retinal dialysis, you know, uh, they can they need a bigger, uh, thick, uh, thicker buckle to support. But a lot of us are now very well managing it with vitreous surgery. And they also behave like large tears. Uh, I think you can always uh, trim the edges and convert it into a retinal tear. And I would like to take opinion of Dr. Ulrich that a large HSTs uh, really don't need any kind of support. They normally stay attached. It's actually uh, the associated PVR, which is like because of RP, which uh, is a trouble and challenge. But break itself are very well addressed by now current uh, vitreoretinal uh, surgical techniques, the larger breaks. Uh, so I like to take opinion of Dr. Ulrich also that uh, do we still have to support these huge, uh, large HSTs with uh, some explant? Well, well, in case of an aura dialysis, I would only do a segmental buckle. I would not uh, do a vitrectomy because I think they do very well with buckling oh, I will ask only. With PVR, not, uh, not uncommon. Uh, yeah, like a coronary aura dialysis, well, I mean, I, I still, I still think I don't know. How, I don't know how much PVR you get in 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 um, in uh, Indian patients, but you will not you will not get too much PVR. I mean, I've seen like a few dialysis which were like two three years old. You could still do a buckling. There was some immature PVR maybe, but not too much. If you have these giant tears, in those I use actually silicone oil, but no buckling either. Yeah. One more situation. One more situation, Doctor Ulrich. Uh, till the time I was dealing only with the anterior surface PVR, means the PVR which is above the retina, above the ILM. I was thinking, oh, the, the, this is a very bad case. The next one is also a very bad case. But when I dealt with one case in which napkin ring close on a lardy was there, and total spider web like. PVR was there on the posterior surface, on the macula everywhere. So what is the best way? And in that case, I did 360 degree RR 
then almost two, two and a half hour I have taken to take out the membrane, but it was not coming out so easily, the subretinal PVR. So what is the best way to deal with the subretinal PVR? It, it was yeah. not behaving. It was not behaving like a membrane over the retina. The, the membrane which is under the retina is totally different. It is means it is stuck just like a glue to the photoreceptors. So what is mm. the best way according to you to deal with the subretinal PVR? Well, uh, I mean, I mean, it is a big con conglomerate of subretinal membranes. I would actually almost do a peripheral retinectomy and approach this from and and then flap over the retina. So you have a much easier approach to remove the huge um, the subretinal structures there. I mean, if this, you have such a big um, structure, if you have these napkin rings, you have to open any case from the periphery to access this part. Um, if there's only a small band, I would actually do it like I showed you in the video. Do you do you get my point? Absolutely. When the retinectomy is due, so I think there is uh, it makes a very valid uh, uh, approach to have a retinectomy first and then uh, take care of that extensive subretinal band. Absolutely agree. And I think like Sir, Dr. Ulrich has shown, uh, biomanual approach is extremely important. Uh, and you plan your removal. If you have a matrix going on, plan it in a way that your fovea should not get rubbed uh, by, you know, when you are pulling the subretinal band, it should not rub or, and damage the fovea. Sometimes it's good to leave some parts and, uh, you know, uh, just transect it, remove the maximum. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, I just want to share, uh, I had one case long ago in which napkin ring appearance was there and total subretinal PVR and the membrane, I, I thought, okay, I'll go, I, I did 360 degree RR, I'll go inside, I'll go put the retina on one side and I, I'll take out the whole membrane just like a sheath, but it was not at all coming, means it, it was not behaving like a membrane over the surface of the retina. It, the, the, the adhesion was totally different. So I, I, at that time, I don't know how to deal with this membrane. It was coming in bits and pieces and very, very small. And every time I was having this impression, I am pulling and I'm taking out the photoreceptors and all the layers of the retina, just like that. So how to deal was with it? Was that case uh, with the vitreous hemorrhage or uh, like uh, some vascular? Um, uh, I no, I, I, uh, and those are brittle subretinal bands. They look like fibrous. But when you approach, they are very brittle. Uh, so, yes. So, so don't, no point worrying about them. You can, uh, you mm. know, it's the fibrous ones which are like cords, which will lead to traction and keep retina detached. If if it's breaking so easily, it's the brittle. It looks like subretinal band, but it's not fibrous. So maximum you can do is uh, transect the uh, major uh, major ones. And, and and leave it alone. Uh, sometimes okay. I've seen the buckling being done. You all of us have seen and done buckling and nicely uh, reattached retina despite a matrix of subretinal band. Sir, uh, to I the panel. Like yeah. Sorry. A I would just want a small comment for Dr. Atul here uh, that uh, sometimes it's a intraretinal fibrosis. And these long-standing closed funnel retinal detachments, they might have even splitting of the retinal layers. So that may look like membranes, but maybe the photoreceptors which have separated. So it's not always that we need to remove because these intraretinal fibrosis cannot be relieved. It can sometime, you know, massage can sometime help in relieving and making it more smooth so that the retina attaches or it's the radial retinectomy sometimes help. Thank you. Uh, just to add the question uh, here, ma'am, uh, any, anything that you would like to do in anterior PBS 
uh, or uh, try to remove as much of anterior PVR if you can, or uh, uh, do a retinectomy straight away in such situation where uh, it is difficult. Again, the anterior PVR main concern is how vascular is the retina, peripheral retina. So if you have multiple lattices or peripheral avascular retina, it will be not easy to relieve this vitreous base. And they usually tend to have a more posterior and a lo longer vitreous base. So sometimes it's not possible. Even there are some patients where there is a vitreo interface disorder like fever or maybe a ROP sequelae or even high myopia patients with peripheral avascular retina. So these are the patients where I tend to consider doing a retinectomy and I don't try to stretch it much more because it will create more retinal breaks and a retinectomy will help in these situations. Otherwise, most of the patients when we are seeing membranes Yes, it's better that we try and remove as much as possible and support with a buckle for the unleave traction. Okay, uh, Dr. Ulrich, one more situation, hypothetical situation is uh, you are doing a case which was previously done by some other surgeon and uh, you have removed the oil and on table you are seeing anterior PVR is there and again you have to attach the retina, then when will you remove the oil? Is it three or four months or you will leave for more means till one year? What's your take? As in my experience that I think this, these long these long tamponades is only for your own psychology, for your own well-being. I think after six weeks, maybe two months, maximum three months, there is no difference. You can move after two months, after one year will be the same result. It will detach or not detach. Dependent, sir? I think uh, the reason for retaining it for long term is, is only when uh, you know uh, you are uh, holding it uh, uh, for regmatogenous confinement. There is some unrelieved traction and uh, some residual detachment. Then you tend to let it be there for not only months but sometimes years. But I agree. Uh, I think uh, most of the things uh, will get uh, settled by three months. So if you are retaining it longer, it's only that uh, on the, those one-eyed patients and where there is high risk of uh, uh, you know retinal detachment. So you are just giving them a chance that if they can carry on with silicon oils for maybe a few years or so those are the situations in bad trauma cases and you are also not sure whether there will be hypotony uh, the, your pressures are on the lower side so those are the cases where there you retain oil for longer uh, but the tamponade uh, benefit is uh, you know not needed beyond three months i agree there's, there's one more thing I think you could do, uh, Dr. Atul. Uh, let's say you have a silicon oil inside the eye and one focal detachment or something. Um, if, if you, I mean, you remove the oil and you find a focal detachment, then you could put the oil back and make a scatter laser on the focal detachment and then remove the oil after three months. Then, then it, will, it, it will remain attached there. Okay. Okay, Dr. You understand, Wong. Understand my yeah, yeah. point? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Wong, what is your take about the uh, silicone oil removal in a re detachment surgery? Uh, I've got a similar opinion with Dr. Ulrich and Dr. Dipendra. I think uh, you don't really need to keep it beyond two to three months. I think uh, that seems to be the, the, the standard. I think if you're going to use you're going to use it beyond that period of time. It's it's not really for surgical purposes. It's probably for a patient to say, let's just, let's say this patient has gone through a couple of surgeries and this is the only eye, and the patient really wants to take a break. I think that's the other thing that I would consider keeping it a bit longer, or other other health reasons. But anything beyond that, I think uh, two or three months, you really can take it out and and uh, proceed to the next stage of recovery.
Dr. Wong, there is something called foldable capsular vitreous body. Is it available? It is available in China. Is it available in Malaysia? Uh, or ex no, extreme, case, extreme PVR cases or trauma cases? Uh, unfortunately, it's not available in Malaysia yet. Any experience of the India? panel? Is this a vitreous substitute? What is this uh, you mean? Yes, it's a, it's like a vitreous substitute. It's a uh, capsule-like thing, and it's inflated inside the eye. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in China, they are using it for uh, severely damaged eyes, traumatized eyes, and eyes with severe PVR to prevent thysis. Uh, botany eyes, maybe. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay, thank Well, I can just say in Europe, the, 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 these, all these new substances, they are going through such a huge, um, I say not sort of FDA procedures. It was much earlier, easier five years ago. It's been getting very difficult. Now we had some cases, toxic cases with perfluorocarbon, and this made, uh, this destroyed a lot of um, confidence. Uh, Dr. Ganesh? Dr. Barbara had a question like, uh, when do you choose retinectomy? Like, what is the time when you think that, yes, it, this case needs retinectomy? Uh, yes. Uh, um, the first one was actually the timing. I wouldn't do it in the first surgery. Um, so I would be in the second surgery. Then I would first remove all membranes. So if they're all removed and the retina is still stiff, then you actually have, uh, then you have interretinal PBR. And this can only be addressed with retinal retinotomy. Um, so, yeah. And then you should be always uh, not, not, be, not, not too small, uh, more generous, but in most cases, I think that 180 degrees is sufficient. And it's mostly in the inferior pole, which has to be done. Yeah. Dr. Um, Ulrich, if, if, you, if, you, if you had a chronic retinal detachment with you know, severe infraretinal uh, PVR inferiorly, and this is the first surgery, would you then consider a primary retinectomy? In the third surgery, of course, yeah. In the, in the first surgery, yeah. In the first. In no, the first I, year. so this is chronic. So say three, four months of presentation, and you know for some reason the guy never never turned up, and you tried peeling and and you put TFTL and it's not not flattening. Would you would you do retinectomy prim primarily? I mean, let's let us let us let's, let's take two two scenarios. If there would be a big rupture, then was, this will be a problem. So the rupture has to be closed. Say say where there's no rupture and the inferior pole, you can definitely only put. I mean, you can say I want to I want to do retinectomy and be the whole case flat, but why not choose actually on a, in inject silicon oil and just wait what happens? And you can still go in the eye after two two months or three months and see if maybe there is less PVR and less interest in PVR present. Mm -hmm. What 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 do the other panels? Uh... Uh, how how would you approach this similar case? I think uh, the answer to that question and Dr. Barbara's question, uh, all of us, I think, do it in similar way that we uh, go ahead with peelings. Uh, and as we approach the periphery, most of us are able to peel uh, uh, till equator. Uh, it's almost very uh, rare to be not able to peel. Problem starts when you go beyond equator. And uh, so, and, and you start thinking of retinotomy the moment you start getting one or more tears and you realize that membranes are now stronger than the retina. So the most of us would switch to cutter and try to do, go biomanual and see if we can segment those peripheral uh, membranes and at least separate them and uh, uh, you know, relieve the, the circumferential uh, part. And then uh, if you have already created it here in periphery, you go for that uh, fluid air ex uh, experiment 
which the Dr. Steve uh, very fondly calls him reattachment experiment. And uh, the moment you realize that uh, air has gone subretinal, I think uh, that's the time to go ahead with uh, retinectomy. And as rightly pointed out, 180 degree is uh, more sufficient for most cases. So that's the sequence. Uh, I, I think most of us start with peelings, and if you are lucky and it comes off, or you are able to, you know, have a successful reattachment ex experiment, then you will not do a retinectomy. And uh, so I think that that's how I approach all these uh, cases. Depend sir. Suppose a patient is there in which you are doing the surgery and on table you find that subretinal air has gone. So yeah. whether you will change your mind at that time that you'll close your both the uh, port and do the 360 degree that, that buckle in circlage or you will directly go for the RR. No, I think uh, if you if you see a subretinal air going in uh, any detachment case, first thing I would do is check my uh, infusion cannula. And is it going from that side, uh, you know, uh, so then I, I will address that, you know, how to address uh, subretinal cannula. But if it is going from an open break, like uh, shown by Dr. Ulrich in one of the videos, then uh, uh, I think uh, uh, first we'll, I'll again, uh, if it is in a limited area, I will switch on the fluid and try to peel uh, around the break. And if I am able to peel membranes around that break, from where the air has gone inside, uh, you know, I, I can again go back and do the reattachment experiment again. But if it is a large break and I have done enough peeling and I have a massive uh, subretinal air, I would rather proceed for a retinectomy rather than add a buckle at that point. Uh, I would like to know how uh, other panelists would approach this. Uh, okay. By adding the buckle, can you decrease the size of your RR? Yeah, but I think uh, most of us uh, will hesitate to do an unplanned buckle, uh, you know, in, in a situation like this. Uh, most of our cases now, even PVR cases, we manage them with primary uh, vitrectomy. Uh, so in our setup, really, we'll have to discuss uh, buckle also with the patient and, you know, and, and uh, uh, passing, uh, uh, you know, a buckle to avoid a retinectomy in, in intraoperatively, uh, I think I would, I, I have never done that. Uh, I would uh, love to hear a comment of Dr. Ulrich that uh, will he go ahead and plan a buckle on table or like is it, if it's part of preoperative plan, then it's fine. Dr. Um. Ulrich? Yes, I'm listening. Uh, um, uh, I think I think uh, let's put this. If you take this this case I showed in the in the presentation, let's say I would start with encircling band, then actually would in this case I would actually try to do an a radial buckle. Only buckle the the rupture the break. Um, I mean, that's actually I think the question. I would spontaneously, yes, I would spontaneously. I would, you, you could just, you can mark the the, the buckle position with the, with a pen on the cornea, and you place a, a five millimeter buckle in the radial um, way, radial meridian over this position, and you can close this rupture. I think this this I would do otherwise, um, but this I think this 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 big break has to be closed. Um, and then your option, retinectomy, of course, that's, that's the second option. In, in my experience, um, which I don't like in the first surgeries, that you have this terrible posterior contraction of the retina. So if you have already such so much interretinal PVR, um, which makes that the air goes subretinal and you do retinectomy, then you have a, and, and then of course, a small one will not be sufficient. You have to make a big one, at least 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and you have this, terrible and a posterior contraction of the retina. And then you have these, these folding edges and you have more PVR at the edges. That's what I don't like about this, about this retinectomy in the first surgery. It causes more and more problems. Um, and um, you have to go in and in again because you have PVR at the edges. 
Um, and I think also anatomically it doesn't look too good. So I would, I would actually, that's why I would actually like to wait for this uh, procedure, uh, like as last, last resort. Okay, and uh, Dr. Ganesh, you want to ask something? I think Dr. Ganesh, and Dr. Kaushik? Yes, Dr. Atul. Oh. I think we had a uh, great discussion today. Mm. Are there any more questions? No, I, I, I think we have already oh, answered all the yeah, just to add on one more, I think in, in Dr. Ulrich's book, he's quite, he's described it, how, how he would add on a buckle uh, intraoperatively. I think he protects the, 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 the volume of the eye by injecting PFCL, and then he removes uh, the inferior uh, trochas, and then he puts on a buckle, and then and he repositions the, uh, the, the inferior troca for the infusion. And I think uh, there are many other authors who have done uh, something similar. I think if you if you were to attempt to put a segmental or a radio buckle uh, intraoperatively, it's very important to uh, make sure that the volume of the eye does not get compromised. Uh, and and PFTL still is is really the way to go. Uh, there there are cases where you try to do it under air or under fluid, and you can easily run into trouble and get a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. So be very careful. Uh, yeah, Dr. Ulrich, Dr. one more question. Okay, it's it's easy to take out the subretinal PFCL, but how to take out the subretinal silicone oil? If the retina is attached and a small bubble has gone inside, how to take it out? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, so, I mean, first you remove, of course, the silicone oil inside, which is cavity. Then sometimes you can uh, indent the retina from the side and press some of the oil outside. But in the case of heavy oil, uh, sorry, in the case of light oil, the, the silicon oil, of course, will be interiorly. So um, you may have to make an interior break or it's next to me to remove the, the, the last part. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I got it. I got it. Um, so um, I think it's easy, uh, Dr. Atul, if it's uh, uh, retina is detached. But if you have a emulsified or subretinal oil in attached retina, that becomes a real challenge. It, it doesn't move. Uh, and uh, so I would like to hear if we, uh, Dr. Ulrich, if he had uh, uh, this encounter uh, subretinal emulsified oil in attached retina. And, you have removed the oil in the vitreous cavity, but what to do about that? And it also tells you that there is an open break somewhere. Yes, it is always a it's always a very bad situation. I agree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is um, not a pleasant start to start surgery with suppressional oil. Uh, I must I must honestly say I never had this case suppressional oil. So you mean that like uh, hundreds, hundreds of hundreds of small bubbles? Yes, yes. Yeah, I that's, had that's... once, and uh, I, I didn't. I have. I'm still finding the answer. I, I think. I think. I think. I, I. Yeah. Yeah. Please, Doctor Ekta. Please. In such situation, I usually try to do multiple fluid gas exchanges so that. You know, the retina again detaches, again attaches, this mobilizes the subretinal silicon oil bubbles, and that helps in maximizing the removal. So just to be patient and try to do more frequent fluid gas exchanges. All right. Because challenges, if you switch on the air, it starts going down to the towards posterior pole, and if you switch on the fluid, uh, it's you know, uh, then you have to create a very anterior uh, break to take it out completely. I, I tried creating multiple retinotomy so I could remove it in part, but then some bubble were left alone and I tried to do, uh, do some laser around it. 
because I was worried that this patient is going to redetach uh, because uh, you know sub subretinal oil means there was some break and but uh, I uh, off late I don't even remember what happened to that patient. Uh, if it's just the silicon oil emulsified, most of the time it will come out through your retinotomy when you are doing a fluid gas exchange. Oh, but if it's mixed, right now is attached. Absolutely attached. Okay. Yeah. That okay. Was <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's challenging. Yeah. Sir, what happens if you leave it like that? If it is attached, if there are some subretinal oil bubbles, some emulsified oils. What happens if it is not in the posterior pole? What happens if you leave it like that? Ultimately, I had to, but uh, 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 I think my biggest uh, uh, thing was that there is some break and this oil bubble, these oil bubbles will behave like SRF. You know, uh, so sooner or later, uh, you they, they will clearly open, it will open the break. That was the only concern, but I think, yes, you, you rightly pointed out if the, rather being re-retaching the retina to get rid of those bubbles, clearly it, it would have been better to leave leave it alone. And that's what I ultimately I did. Yes, sometimes PF seal bubbles also are there in the periphery. There are small PF seal bubbles and it actually doesn't cause any clinically significant harm if it is not subcovial. Yeah. It's even you can do a localized laser around that area if you are worried about the migration to the fovea they are in the periphery yeah i agree that I, that's what i did i created multiple to retinotomies and aspirated so it gets aspirated only in the immediate vicinity and then the distant ones they are totally undisturbed so then i just did lasers so that it doesn't go to wrong areas Mm -hmm. Dr. Gosik, any other question left? No, I don't think so. I think we had an order. Uh, if, 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 if one, one question only. Sorry, yes. I'm asking yes, as, yes. As, a, as, as a European uh, to, to my Indian colleagues, how much PVR do you have in your, in your patient collective? Is this a very many patients or how often does it happen? Depends, I sir. Uh, how how common is PVR detachment in your patient collective? It's not more than ten to uh, fourteen percent. Uh, I, I have recently reanalyzed my five years data, so uh, I think uh, uh, roughly around twelve to fourteen percent patients were found. Ten to fourteen percent. Uh, we have a more problem of having chronic cardiac uh, uh, mm -hmm. detachment non not uh, being detected timely. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, PVR rates, I think, uh, are similar to, I think, Western uh, rates. Maybe I think Dr. Atul and Dr. Ekta can tell us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, in India, what happens is that patients usually report late because the diagnosis or the access to the facility is slightly late and they tend to present with primary PVR. So they tend to present with more PVR changes. But if you're talking about a primary surgery and then PVR, probably that's not very significant. But when I see here in US, like definitely the primary PVR patients are less. Mm -hmm. uh, same here. We've, most of the patients are coming. I'm not able to see from the last three months or four months, maybe six months and a couple of patients are coming. They are, they are telling I am not able to see from the last two years also. And I have gone to 10 or 12 people and they are, they are advising that nothing can be done in this case. So they, they are wasting time like this also. Uh, because of this, the primary PVR is more in our cases. Secondary PVR, I think after the re-detachment surgery, it's almost same. Hmm. But depends upon where, where we are doing our work. If we are doing the work in metro cities, the patients are coming early. So the number, the the stage of PVR is very less. But if the mm -hmm. patient is coming from far off, from the urban, from the village places, then 
certainly the the stage PVR stage is quite severe. When operating in Caucasians, definitely like when we are more comfortable using the gas because yes, there are less PVR chances, but still when operating in Indians or more pigmented races, like uh, still PBR possibilities are higher. And I used to use more silicon oil at that time. Mm. So uh, Dr. Kaushik, can we wind up? Yes, I think I think we can wind up. It was an interesting discussion, and actually, PVR is something which is very difficult to treat, especially when it happens with your own operated patients. And uh, we were lucky to have uh, Dr. Ulrich, and his videos are wonderful. And we thank Dr. Dipender sir, Dr. Ekta Ma'am, Dr. Wilson Wang, and Dr. Uh, Atul for their kind inputs, and. I, uh, I'll thank my partners in academic sale, Dr. Ganesh Pillai and Dr. Mayank and Dr. Atul for organizing this wonderful meet. Thank you, everyone. I think we learned something new today and we'll be bringing you new, new webinars which we'll uh, share soon. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dipendra, sir. Thank you, Ekta, madam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adul and everybody. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, soon we, soon we will tell about the next program, next master class. Sure, sure. You are doing wonderful uh, job. I think wish you all the best. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night.